Hey everybody, Alex Goff here on the Miss Pass on Flow Rugby. I'm all alone again this time. I don't even have a guest with uh, Adam traveling and Michael is sick, so he's not in the corner. Uh, yeah, I'm checking in the corner. He's, I hope he's going to get better. So I have some stuff I needed to talk to you about. Uh, it's been kind of a wild new year. Happy New Year to everybody. And, and over the new year, well, this has been fun. Uh, it all started with a big mistake on my part. So we're looking to do polls. We're looking to have readers get engaged and vote for stuff. And we wanted you to vote for our favorite, or your favorite, um, men's national team player, women's national team player. My mistake was that when I put up the men's poll, which I put them up first, I ended up just saying, vote for your favorite player. Yeah, big mistake. My fault, no one else's, just mine. But the upshot of this was that a lot of those readers who voted saw that I didn't have any women's players as the option. Naturally, they say, well, how about some women's players? If we're talking about the best player, best rugby player, how about some women's players? This threw off the results. It was hilarious um, uh, in how I had to sort of navigate through this. So, so I, I want to show you the, the results here. Uh, so first of all, if you look at the, the, the total results, Winning by a landslide is other, and A.J. McGinty has about 25% of uh, the total votes and is the top one of the, the options I gave. But I gave people an option to write in, and that was other, and a whole bunch of people wrote in there. Mike Teo is sort of a distant second in terms of the named players, but A.J. McGinty, 25%. So you start to look in all these write-ins, and... Let's have a look and see what is the number one uh, write-in. And we use sort of a cloud thing for that. Alev Kelter, yes, very nice. So terrific player from Alaska for the USA uh, Women's Sevens team. And then she showed that she was everything that everybody thought she was for the 15s team at the Women's World Cup. Um, I think uh, they realized pretty quickly they should have had her in the starting lineup the whole time. A Lev Kelter, superb player. She doesn't quite get enough to knock out AJ McGinty as the top men's player. She got only 20% of the votes. So uh, to start with then, AJ McGinty, your reader's top men's player, and I think a, a, an exactly the right vote. Um, he was the best player uh, for 2017. So then, then we've got the women's vote comes through. This seems to be obvious, right? So we're going to vote for the women. We've well, already said that Alev Kelter is far and away the number one player, and just barely behind A.J. McGinty in terms of rugby player of male or female. So, okay, check this out. Kelter leads, but with the names that we gave people, uh, with only about 18%, right? You know, less than a fifth, with Nia Tapper right behind. Other... Again, leading by a huge amount, what's the number one name we're seeing in other? Nicole Heverland. So, go back. Alev Kelter should be the best player. We expected that to be because of all those write-ins in the men's side. And then we go back to the women's thing, and there's suddenly a massive rush to write in Nicole Heverland. Uh, Heverland, uh, West Point product, uh, excellent player, fly half. Uh, a playmaker and, and, and a captain of the Sevens team. And, and I think that she's developing into a player that you can follow. Uh, I, I had my issues with who the uh, U.S. Women's Sevens team had as a captain uh, last couple of years, and I think they needed to make a change. They did make a change, and eventually they settled on Heverland, and I think they've got exactly the right player probably for uh, for leading this team. That being said, Alev Kelter is the best women's player uh, of 2017. I think it's pretty clear that not only is she a playmaker and a play finisher, but she's also someone, certainly the sevens team and the 15 team really relies on to make key tackles, to win key ball, to do pretty much everything. And certainly on the sevens team, Kelter does it all and does it better, really, than anyone else. Uh, she, doesn't, she doesn't play, 
they don't do as well. I mean, it's, it, it's clear. Um, but I really enjoyed that. <laughs> I thought it was. You know, I would love to hear what Michael and Adam think of these these things. But I'm interested to hear what you think about it too. You can put it in the comments uh, uh, along with this show. But uh, yeah, the write-ins were uh, very very vocal, and we hear you as well. Apologies for not differentiating those polls. Uh, we look a little bit though. Um, if you go back to the the USA women's team. Uh, 2017 was a pretty good year. Uh, fourth in the, the Rugby World Cup. I, I don't think, well, you know, it, it's an improvement, right? It's an improvement in placement and it's an improvement over uh, finishing sixth last time. Um, it's an improvement in finishing fifth the time before that. Um, but I wouldn't rate this team yet better than, say, the 2006 team, which finished fifth in Edmonton. Uh, that team was, in fact, I, 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 would, I would say that if the 2006 Women's Eagles played the 2017 Women's Eagles, 2006 would win. And I wouldn't necessarily say that about any other era. That's a 11-year difference. Um, and in, le in, in that kind of uh, time frame, you see the science behind developing better athletes get better. The training gets better, all those things. I would say you, you pluck that 2006 team in as they were then, put it on the field against 2017, 2006 wins. Uh, in the World Cup there, they beat Australia twice. They shut out Scotland. Uh, they beat Ireland. And they did lose to England 18-0. Um, they were extremely unlucky to lose that game. They got kind of refereed off the park in that game. They went 4-1. Uh, and one. Now, the 2017 team, while they finished... And in 2006, they finished fifth because they, they lost that game to England. They were in the pool of death. Um, and Canada, interestingly, was in an easier pool, easier games. They, they logged more bonus points and got to be in the semifinals, and they ended up finishing fourth. Role kind of reversed this time around. And uh, USA in a little bit of an easier pool. They lost to England, but they got a bonus point, and that's impressive. They beat Italy 24-12. Uh, beat Spain big, but they lost to New Zealand, lost to France. Um, so they ended up two and three, and they came fourth. They were four and one in 2006. They came in fifth. Uh, 2006, they played really good teams all the way through. 2017, they played some really good teams and some teams that were struggling. Um, just, just a thought there. The point being, not to not denigrate the 2017 effort, is to say that there's more to do and there are better, th better things that they could do. They can get better. Now, my thought about this sort of dovetails into some of the things you're going to be seeing in the future on Flow Rugby, which is for the USA women's national team to get better, they need to play tougher games on a regular basis. We're not playing enough. We're not playing enough teams. I think even playing some kind of tournament where it's three games in, in a week, a week and a half, that's not enough. It's more about playing five games over, the, over a course of, of a few months along with some training. Um, I think that we need to see more games as well. We need to see why it is that England continues to be so strong. Why New Zealand? Why France? Everyone forgets about France. France has been in the top three country, top three or four country, for decades now. Uh, why are they so good? Well, we've got to watch them. We've got to play them. I think we need to find a way to play France and England or England every single year. I think we need to find a way to play Canada twice every single year and not just in a quick, we play on Wednesday and we play on Saturday. I know what that means is money, which USA Rugby doesn't have, and time, which I'm not sure the players have. But I think just relying on a really strong women's premier league, which is strong, and uh, thinking that that's going to get us to the true top four is, is a pipe dream. But if we expose ourselves more to what's going on internationally, I think that's going to be good for the women's 15s team. Um, so that was it. That was, that was kind of the, the whole thing there, all starting from... 
me making a mistake makes me think about how we're going to make the women's eagles better. Uh, AJ McGinty got the, the, the Reader's Player of the Year for the men, and, and I'd go along with that. I think that uh, McGinty is uh, you know, a, a really, really reliable kicker, which I think is good. I think he's a good kicker from, from moderate distance and, and tough angles, very important. But he gets the easy ones done, which I, I, I w would much rather start with somebody who gets the easy ones. Um, he's also a solid tackler. He's a strong guy. He doesn't look big. I mean, he and I talked about this one time, and I was saying, you're not very big. And he goes, hey, you know, I'm six feet. I'm almost 200 pounds. He still don't look it. Um, but he, he tackles well. I think we know also that McGinty's great ability is to make tacklers miss, to slide through a gap, do sort of a John Rutherford thing, uh, get through, and that's when he frees people up. So if he can get through the, the tackle, suddenly he's past the gain line, suddenly there's maybe three defenders are now behind him, that's when Marcel Brachy, uh, Bryce Campbell, Blaine Scully, Mike Teo, those guys, suddenly they, they've got some space to work with. Uh, that is why McGinty is the best player on the team, because he makes that all, uh, offense work. My issue is, can we center an offensive approach around that player if we don't have him all the time? And is his backup the same kind, kind of guy? Well, right now, Will McGee, uh, ben Sema, these guys are not quite the same. I don't think they run with the same aggressiveness. Um, they're probably better kickers from the hand, just a little bit. Sema is world class from the tee. Um, they're just a little different. And maybe that little difference is too much, or maybe it's, it's okay. But I think that one of new coach Gary Gold's uh, jobs will be in terms of formulating an offensive approach is not to say, okay, we've got McGinty at fly half and we can do this kind of attack. We can attack with him first, right? We, we use him as the first strike and then spread out from him. But you can't do that if no one else can run it that way. So then you need to either have a, a plan B that everybody immediately switches on about or you try to mold some more number 10s because he's going to get hurt. Hopefully not. He's going to be not available. We know that, right? We know we're not going to have him available. So how do we do that? Uh, in the past, it seems like we've relied a little bit more on the kicking and say, you know, you're not a runner. Don't run. Don't run. Just, just pass it or kick it. And I'm not so sure I love that approach because I kind of feel like I'd rather have everyone approaching it the same way. And if Ben Sema can make a, a tackler miss once, but he doesn't have that acceleration, that's okay. Take a few steps, now we pass, now we kick, now we do something else. Now that's what I'd like to see. That's, that's what made me think about McGinty. Um, Flow Rugby, and, and, and this is going to be a short show. <laughs> it's probably not that short a show. Actually, uh, Flow Rugby is coming up with some, some big events, and, and we're going to wrap up with just a little bit of thought about what we're going to be doing now uh, through the, the first few months of 2018. We've got a few things that are just about ready to be announced. Very excited about that. We, can, uh, we have announced that we've got all the home games for Life University, men and women, through uh, this spring. Uh, that's really great. And we also have the Pacific Rugby Premiership, which is men's club uh, competition on the West Coast. And we're going to be showing three events on that. The opening weekend, um, all six teams playing. Uh, a middle weekend, all six teams playing. And the finals weekend, all six teams playing. And we'll be showing that. So you'll be able to see six of the best clubs on the West Coast playing live on Flow Rugby. Now, I wanted to bring it up partly because of that because I'm excited about it. And I'm excited because I haven't written about these guys in a while. Um, I miss them. 
But these are, this is Belmont Shore, Life West, Ombak, Olympic Club, San Francisco Golden Gate, and Santa Monica. These are clubs everybody's heard of, right? These are clubs that produce national team players. Last week we had Danny Barrett on the show. Danny Barrett is an SFGG alum, as is uh, Samu Manoa and Falau Niua. Mikey Teo played at Belmont Shore, so did Joe uh, Tawafete. Colin Hawley is still on Olympic Club. Uh, Tim Maupin played with them. And it's just a couple of examples. Um, we see a lot of national team players coming out of that league. Last year, the PRP didn't play because they decided to um, uh, sort of step aside for pro rugby and, and, and hope that pro rugby did something. Um, now they're back, and let's say last year, 2016, but you know, what they did was they took a break. And um, they're back sort of really solid now because I think they've got a place in the American rugby landscape in a way that's kind of unique. Um, very few clubs have that long-term strength. I mean, Belmont Shore was a Super League champion in the late 90s. That's how long these uh, have been doing. When I, you know, back in like, what was it, uh, 1997, 98, I was writing for Rugby World magazine um, and they had a club, best club in, in each country, in each rugby country, and they picked Ombak back in the, in the 90s. And Ombak won as a Super League champion. Golden Gate was a Super League champion. Um, the other ones have been really close. And, and I, think, I think one of the issues with you know, uh, how we've handled you know, club rugby in America is that we've never really figured out exactly who's at what level everybody is. You know, if you're in Division I and there was Super League, you'd still say, well, I think we're just as good. And, you know, uh, the PRP is looking at Major League Rugby and thinking, we're going to coexist. We're not going to compete. We're going to coexist. What you're going to see in the PRP is young players who are just out of college or don't go to college, just out of high school, are looking to think about professional rugby or at least make rugby, you know, what, can I get to the next level? They're going to go play in the PRP. If they can get a pro contract, Major League Rugby, whatever, overseas, I mean, we just saw uh, Seattle Seawolf, uh, David Ainu'u, leave the Seawolves to go sign on a development contract in Toulouse. We're going to see a lot more of that. Um, you're going to see these young players. You're going to see the stars of tomorrow on the PRP. So Life West has already fi kind of figured this out. Junior Helu, Zach Bonte, uh, Hulu Holo Mangaloa, those guys are already on Life West. And you're seeing a very young team on Life West. Um, a few guys that you know, we've seen for a while are going to be on some of the other clubs but they're going to skew younger as time goes on. Um, and we're going to see uh, a system, a real pathway, not just, you know, people talk about high school, college, national team. Well, you know, college to national team is a massive gap. And then they say, well, club something. So here is like high school, college, and or PRP, hopefully the ARP a little bit better, ARP on the, on the uh, East Coast. Major League Rugby, Major League Rugby, USA Selects, USA Selects, Eagles. That's a better pathway. That makes sense to me. Um, and you're certainly going to see a better pathway for young Polynesian American players um, because sometimes you know, they're getting more opportunities in college. But you also see some that don't go to college. Um, they learn a trade, which is great and they want to play some rugby. Well, they have a place not only to play some rugby, but to be seen by some, some major coaches, and Flow Rugby is going to be part of that, and I'm pretty excited about that. So, uh, Finally, as we wrap this up, we talked about Ainu going to France. I think you're going to see France be a little bit more of a nursery for American players. Uh, Brexit complicates things. It gets so so. We used to be getting a European passport, and you can go anywhere in Europe. But if Brexit splits off Britain, does that make that difficult? Well, go to France. You don't have to worry about that. For Polynesians, uh, 
going to Europe, they actually have a fast track to be able to get a European passport. So I think it makes a lot of sense, and you're starting to see uh, David Tamalau, for example, Samuel Manoa is in France, uh, Ainu'u, Nafi Ma'afu in Nabon. You're going to see a lot more of that, um, and I think you'll see a lot more about that on Flow Rugby. So coming up, uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about uh, Life University, St. Mary's, some of the big college games, Central Washington. It's going to UC Davis and St. Mary's this weekend. You'll see a lot more about uh, Gary Gold, the new coach. And we have lined up a couple of uh, pretty cool guests coming up this January. I might actually have some, some people with me uh, next, next week, maybe. Hopefully, Michael will be uh, healthy. Adam will be here. I'll still be here. You know I will be. Uh, Alex Goff for Flow Rugby. And we'll catch you next week on the Miss Pass. <laughs>